I would only know as to this particular lady that I and everyone I know has been extremely impressed of her energy and her approach to the operations of the judiciary and most particularly setting a goal which is very unusual for time limits in the Court of Appeals decisions coming down from the date of our and actually meeting it. And I gather from the daily record with four days to spare, yes. which ain't bad. <coughs> um, but were she to do nothing else, and my only other suggestion might be that the court seek to limit its opinions to 10 or 12 pages. Because <laughs> um, the older I get, and I suspect the rest of you get, uh, the more troublesome dicta becomes and confusing. And we're confused enough. So. But without further ado, and her topic, she says, is what I've done and where we're headed. And that's what we're here to hear from her, not from me. And without further ado, Chief Judge Barbera, the Chief Judicial Officer of the State. Well, so I quickly, uh, I'm so happy to be here. I, I made a, what ultimately was an unsuccessful attempt to change the person of the of the pronoun. It isn't what I've done, it's what we have done and what we will be doing. Uh, because it is, you know, they say no one can do anything alone, and that is certainly true. It does take many, many fine, dedicated people. I have to say I am absolutely thrilled to be here. When I was told that you had called, um, reached out to uh, the folks in in my chambers to see if I might be interested in coming to speak to you. I said that right away, absolutely, no doubt about it. This because as a lawyer um, here in Baltimore for a number of years, I was proud to work in the Attorney General's office first for Mr. Steve Sachs and then for Mr. Joe Curran. I, I love the law as we all do in this room. I love the profession. And I greatly admire and an admirer of not just the profession, but of so many of the good people in this room. Uh, I, I say that with sincerity, um, with a degree of humility, because those of you I've met, and those of you whom I've not met, and there are some that I've just met for the first time today, I'm, I'm thrilled, but all of you, I know your name. And I know your excellent reputation. And it is a privilege. It is a privilege to be here. I am, as I said, I'll use this word more than a few times, I suspect, delighted to be um, here to speak more formally to the senior lawyers section of the Maryland State Bar Association. And I congratulate you, uh, President Schubert, on your ascendancy to the presidency. You hit the ground running and you will keep running, I know, for both the Bar Association and ultimately for the people we serve, the people of Maryland. And to she, my good friend, Camilla Brown, who is on the, to use the baseball analogy, or metaphor, I should say, <laughs> the on-deck circle. Uh, excited that you're here today. You must know, members of this section, uh, the essential role, the essential role you play in Maryland's legal community. After all, we bench and bar rely on, always have, always will, excellent seasoned attorneys such as yourselves to serve as our role models. And you have for so many of us. I can certainly speak um, for myself. Role models not just for those who've been at the bar for some time, but more particularly and acutely for the new men and women joining our bar association. I think um, yours is a special challenge for them because so many of our young lawyers don't think of the profession in the same way that 
I believe I share with all of you. Uh, and so it, it helps to remind them that we are a proud uh, profession and that we do adhere to fundamental principles of professionalism, camaraderie, um, civility, and we need to remind, we don't need to remind ourselves, but we need perhaps to remind some of the younger members of our bar. So that's our charge, yours and mine. Your experience truly proves invaluable to all of us, both members of the bench and the bar. I am inspired, moreover, if I may say, for your ongoing dedication to the State Bar Association. I look around, my eyes fall upon Herb Garten, who has been crucial to, uh, to the development of the, um, the Bar Association. And I know I single you out, because uh, I suspect there are many others in this room who have participated in ways far beyond any I, will, I have known or will know. But uh, thanks to all of you, and of course, to the new guard, uh, President Schubert, Judge Brown, etc., and of course, Paul Carlin. We, you started when you were about, what, 10 and a half? Yeah, I'm only 37 now. <laughs> and then, of course, our very own Mr. Chairman, Mr. President, Hendrickson, thank you. I've been asked to speak to you about really any, any topic of my choice, but I have chosen to give you a recap of some of what we did um, set about doing in the early months of my tenure. It's been a little over a year. And to offer you some thoughts about what I see in store for the Maryland judiciary in the future. Before I begin, though, we all know what day this is, don't we? It's Constitution Day. So I don't need to remind you of the venerable document that really is the bedrock of our great democracy. I was reading an article in the Washington Post this morning, the paper version, not the online. <laughs> I still like to hold the paper. Uh, and I guess it was Akhil Lamar, a professor at Yale University, who said it, it says so much about the reverence we hold for that document and the respect we have for how it has persisted over our, for now 225 years. It was, uh, they signed on in 87, it was ratified in 1788, and went into operation in 1789. As again, you could probably tell me far better than I, but he said to think, this powerful document that guides us in government and in our daily lives, you can carry literally in your pocket. Literally in your pocket. I came to, to learn somewhat recently that the, the Constitution of the country of India looked very much to our Constitution as well as to several others. Yet that document is covers 330 some pages of text, ours far fewer but the words, the simple words, speak profoundly and we adhere to them even today. So many of us in this room, I suspect, I know actually as I look around, have had the privilege to engage with this time-tested document on an ongoing basis. Certainly I've had the privilege of doing so um, as a law clerk to a judge arguing cases in, for the appellate division in criminal cases before our state and federal courts and now in my current role. It is ever an intellectual challenge, ever a delight to have the opportunity to do so. So we as lawyers <coughs> and judges, I think I can speak for all of when I say we live by, and I might even say for, the continued efficacy of that revered document. Once again, I'll say the bedrock of our democracy. As you now know, you've heard it from uh, Mr. Hendrickson, I have rounded the corner into my second year as chief judge. The first year passed quickly, as they always seem to do for us. There was much to do, much to learn. I was eager then, and I remain so today, to embrace the many challenges, the position I hold, not simply as chief judge of the Court of Appeals, but as the administrative head of our state judiciary. I knew at the outset of my tenure in the job that among my first tasks was to identify those changes that should and could be implemented immediately. I speak of changes that were not in themselves particularly surprising or dramatic, but nonetheless made sense to me and would demonstrate, I hope, early on what I expect to accomplish, what I hope to accomplish as chief judge, which is simply this, the fair, 
timely and efficacious delivery of justice to all the people who come to our courts. So as some of you perhaps knew, some of you did not until just a couple of moments ago, uh, I sought and received from my colleagues on the Court of Appeals last summer the pledge that going forward, every case, I will not belabor the point, every case in a given term of the Court of Appeals will be decided in that term. I am pleased but not surprised, knowing my colleagues as I do, not at all surprised, that the court met that benchmark in its first term and expects to do so in future terms of the court. I also believed it important and therefore was committed to identifying precisely who we are <coughs> as Maryland's state <coughs> judiciary. I knew, of course, that we are nearly 300 incumbent judges at all levels of the courts and that we have more than 50 retired judges, some of you here today, who are recalled and served regularly regularly throughout the state. <coughs> By the way, it was made plain to me early on that our state courts, ladies and gentlemen, simply could not run without the service of the retired recall judges. And might I add, so many of them, Paul Alpert, John Fader, Judge Ward, you do it on a volunteer basis because you serve far longer than comes the maximum that you can, you can earn in your pension. So may I ask for a salute to our retired recall judges who are present. In addition to our judges, though, we have more than 4,200 judiciary employees in the fields where the courts are. Did I miss someone? Did I miss someone when I was recognizing I retired? I hope I didn't. Did I? I hope not. Okay. In addition to our judges, we have 4,200 judiciary employees in the fields where the courts are and the action <coughs> takes place, as well as at headquarters in Annapolis. We have a budget of slightly more than half a billion dollars. Now, I thought that was a big number when I came on board, and it is one, but I quickly came to learn that our budget doesn't even make it onto the pie chart of the state's judi overall, uh, overall budget. It is a lean budget, <coughs> indeed and it requires us to operate on a shoestring, but we are strong, we are able, we are creative, and we're doing it. Not that I don't want to ask for more, and I will intend to ask for more on behalf of the courts come this, uh, this next session. Another of my early tasks was to identify how each of us and all of the processes, practices, and policies fit together in the operational scheme of the judiciary. I did that by commissioning a study by the National Center for State Courts, maybe some of you are familiar with that entity, and upon receiving its report and recommendations have begun with a number of judges and key judiciary personnel, the task of reshaping, I believe for the better, our governance structure. It was also crucial at the outset that I meet the many fine people who work in the field throughout our state. I undertook to do that, and I'm pleased to report that this week I will complete my tour of every single courthouse building throughout the state. I was in Catesville District Court this morning, my friends, and this, when I leave you, I'm going to Essex, and then I will visit the Hyattsville Courthouse of the District Court in Prince George's on Friday, and that's it. I have probably 65 or so court buildings. What a what an amazing opportunity that was. Not just to see the plant, not just to, to reintroduce myself to my colleagues, the judges around the state, but to meet the very, 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 and judges, you know who I mean, the men and women who staff the buildings, who make the operations run. We could not take a step without those amazing folks whether they're in at the counter, dealing with, with individuals as they come in, in the back offices, the court administrators, the clerks of the court and their staff, the bailiffs who protect us, the sheriffs, all. I have had the chance to meet them, to listen to them, to shake their hands, and most importantly, to thank them for what they do. They are true public servants. What I have learned from these tours can be, I believe, summed up this way. Tough work performed every day 
by many dedicated and hardworking people. So taking lessons from some of what I have learned this past year, I began early on to implement strategies to streamline and enhance all forms of communication among judges and courthouse employees. My goal has been and to continue to do whatever is reasonable, and that covers a whole host of operational ideas that we have and what we're trying to put into place. If only we had the bucks, we would do it uh, more quickly. To bring 21st century technology to improve <coughs> communication systems, not just in the courthouse, not just for the court employees, but again, for the people who access the courts. We are all about the people. We're for the people. It is our mission. You have heard of the judiciary's ambitious efforts to go electronic, not simply e-filing, but also electronic case management at all four levels of our courts throughout the state. On October 14, just a few weeks away, did I hear anyone hails from Anne Arundel County? I don't think I, okay. Anne Arundel County has stepped up to be our home base our, for the pilot program, again, at all four levels. So what that means, district court, circuit court, Court of Special Appeals and Court of Appeals. We will, for the next six months, be going through the process of identifying, working through the kinks, but we are going to make the process a deliberate one, and I think you would encourage me to do that, so that we will slowly be going throughout the state, and we anticipate by, 19, by 2018 that we will have gone statewide. This is ambitious. We will be, and we will be successful, we will be the first state judiciary in the country to be totally electronic. Now, for folks like myself, at the downward slope of the arc of time and experience, it's a little nerve-wracking, but I'm paid to lead and to be positive, and I am positive. I've talked to so many people about it, we are working very hard to inform, to train, to put out the word to attorneys. If any of you have filings in Anne Arundel County coming up, you need to register. It's easy to do. It takes about a minute and 10 seconds to get it done. Or if you have others in your firms, or if you know others who <coughs> practice some or all the time in Anne Arundel County but might live elsewhere, Deb, Make sure they know they need to register. Easy to do. All they have to do is go on the front page of, of our website and you get step-by-step -step directions where to go, how to make it happen. That is crucial. So I promised my colleagues that I would get the word out on that, and um, that's the commercial for MDAC. I am Sorry. indeed excited. Excited. As part of the overall goal of advancing justice in Maryland, I have relied on two mechanisms for greasing the wheels of the judiciary and the delivery of the message, communication and transparency. I already mentioned some of the ways I have sought to improve communication in-house, but equally when I say that in the family that is the judiciary, but equally important is sharing information with the public at large the coordinate branches of government, you, you, the members of the bar. That's why I'm so delighted to be here today. It is my goal to achieve through communication, not just the appearance of a tran, excuse me, not, yeah, I did say that correctly, not just the appearance of a transparent judiciary, but the reality of it. We need to be transparent. We need the people of Maryland to know <coughs> they can trust what we say and what we do because we're talking about it. We're talking about it. Um, we've erred, we've erred, think some of our missteps along the way, we'll continue to do that. That's, it's, uh, it's very important. As part of that effort, we have made and will continue to make the judiciary's website. I will not belabor that point either, but uh, it, it is ever better in my view. I have nothing to do with it other than to say keep going because we want to make it user friendly to use the phrase. Uh, we want it to be easily accessible, not just to the lawyers and to the judges as well, but we have, as you all know, an increasing number of self-represented litigants. And we need to make 
ourselves as accessible and to make information as accessible as we possibly can. So we are working on that. Many challenges remain, and I, I actually am naturally a bit impatient, but change, as you all know, does take time. A strategic plan is in order for the judiciary, and we are working on one that will sharpen the focus of our efforts, not just to improve operations and process, but to identify how we might better deliver justice in a more fair, timely, and efficacious manner. That's my catchphrase, a fair, timely, and efficacious manner for all the people of our state. To that end, I will be looking at ways to better meet the needs of some of our more vulnerable populations. You spoke about veterans as one group. The young, the socioeconomically disadvantaged, those who have little or no understanding of the English language as they intersect with the courts. Imagine, we are an increasingly wonderfully diverse state. It does, nevertheless, present challenges for us, those of us who represent individuals who need to access the courts uh, and for the, the individuals themselves. So we need to figure out better ways to deliver our product, which is justice, to our constituents, the people of Maryland, all of the people of Maryland, in better ways. You know, my friends, I also include in populations that need our attention the elderly. This past July, I attended the annual conference of chief justices and the conference of state court administrators, national conference. The theme of the conference was, my friends, the silver tsunami. I thought, what are we going to be talking about, the silver tsunami? It is expected that 2050, the growing wave of people 65 years or older, I'm right almost there myself, will make up more than 20% of the population of the United States. And get this, according to the Maryland Department of Aging, in the next six years, it is expected that 25, and I'll be among the group, 25% of the population here in Maryland will be over the age of 65. With the silver tsunami, naturally will come an increase in those individuals who have age-related issues. Uh, we have to recognize them. Mental, physical limitations as those individuals <coughs> access the courts or need others to access the courts <coughs> on their behalf. Guardianship issues, elder abuse issues, both financial and physical witness and juror issues. Think about it. Our jurors, we need to be ready. We need to be accessible. We need to be welcoming. We need to be comfortable environments for our, all of our population to participate. These are just a few of the issues that I have to say gave me heart palpitations back in July when I was attending that conference. I thought, what are we doing as a judiciary in Maryland to get ready? And in the coming months, we will be studying that. I'll need your help. I'm going to ask for your help twice. We have to study how the silver tsunami will affect the operation of our courts and how best we can prepare for it. It's as simple as that. I will, at the very least, entail a collaborative effort with our partners, both inside and outside our legal community. The Maryland State Bar Association, to be sure, to be sure, I'll be coming your way. And this particular section, I'm coming back to you. I need your advice, I need your input, I need your help. Legal service providers will be crucial in this effort. Community organizations, equally helpful. And I need to listen, I need to learn. And I am sure the fine men and women in the executive and legislative branches of government, you going to help me, Jack? Going to help me? I'll be, I'll be there you go. I heard him say it. <laughs> <laughs> we will. Don't. Oh, oh. Well, now I'm told that I. I guess I need to get that in right. It is it. your birthday. <laughs> That's right. You. You. You will. Um, you will certainly uh, remember that this is the day then that I ask for your help. Okay. In closing, I look forward to continuing the work we have started 
I'm excited about the future of the judiciary. Many challenges lay ahead, but with, as I began, with all of us pulling our oars in the same direction, uh, we'll get there. And uh, I mean, I, it's a great opportunity for every one of us. You know, we take up the banner and we move forward. So thank you so much, Rob, for the invitation. Thank you for being here. And I, 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 take a question? I was just going to say, it I'm happy. It is an to unprecedented opportunity to ask <laughs> the chief judge a question. Anyone want to take it? I, you never ask a judge a question, right? Judge Ward. Judge Ward. What's your question? Judge to judge. <laughs> Maybe you won't like my question, but uh, your main job, of course, is deciding cases that come before you. Yes. And in the criminal division, uh, I hear frequently to other people talking mm -hmm. of mere small technicalities in, re in reversing murder sentences, which have become uh, almost uh, the fact that a person is convicted of murder, the chances of getting uh, reversed at either the first or second level is almost 100% in some cases. And uh, I'm, I'm concerned about the fact that I believe that sometimes the appellate court, which is not subject to elections, uh, becomes overly concerned with technicality, such as the questions that are asked on voir dire to juries ahead of time, with the smallest small technicalities, has nothing to do with the issue of guilt or innocence. And so, and I do not criticize you, Judge, because I've admired your decisions, and I follow them closely, even though I have another job now as chairman of the liquor board. <laughs> <laughs> How do we let you slip away? That is, a, <laughs> that is the dumbest decision I ever made. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, I. I just wanted to put that No, and, and I appreciate the question. And uh, you are not the first to pose it uh, in formal and in informal conversations. Um, it is always unsettling, uh, unsettling to, uh, to cause additional resources, particularly after the passage of time, to have retrials. But, you know, and my friend Paul Halpert, I won't, um, we won't put you, Paul, on the spot because you do both the trial work now, uh, and you handle a lot of the murder cases in, in Baltimore City, do you not? Yeah, these days? Yes. Yes. I, I, I can understand. Some, I also some SOBs. Uh, Submittal briefs. Yes. Thank you for <laughs> explaining the acronym. <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. Uh, it, is, it is never done easily, and it's not always unanimous, uh, particularly when you get to the appellate level. And it becomes more challenging uh, as the years go by. That said, you know we all sometimes have to make the tough calls, uh, particularly in the in the sense that appellate courts live and die by precedent, at least in 99% of the of the cases. And sometimes, over over time, the case law has led in a direction that where the next case seems to fit so so neatly or follow directly from the cases prior that it, it generates an answer. And sometimes in doing that, the appellate courts will get to, a, to exactly what you're suggesting. The, um, an uncomfortable decision for certainly, whether it was the trial judge who presided over the case, the party, the the, um, the attorneys who litigated this case on both sides, witnesses, others. Um, again, with the passage of time, it becomes increasingly difficult. But it is it is one of the grim realities of, and the, but essentially the nature of appellate work. So I'm not apologizing for what the court does. At the same time, I'm recognizing um, the sentiment, um, uh, and um, I'm not at all upset by the question. Not at all. It is, it is what we do need to continue to think about. Where do we, 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 um, we do not make any decision easily. It may seem that way from, from others who are reading, but often it's, it's, uh, it takes a lot, of, uh, a lot of energy, thinking, rethinking, right, Judge Alpert, from your days on the Court of Special Appeals and still there. Keep serving there, please. Uh, it, 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 what, not always in a 10-page opinion, 
Um, less than ten. We, yeah. You want a pot, well, yes. <laughs> I used to do that a fair amount on the Court of Special Appeals, but not so much. In the yeah, for time. sure. Less. Uh, so thank you for your question. I appreciate it. Thank Judge you. Johnson? Chief, um, what sort of feedback are you getting or the court getting, either positive or negative, about the court's decision to require uh, an attorney's presence, presence excuse me, at commissioner's hearing? Am I hearing any feedback? <laughs> every day. Okay. Every day. Every day uh, from September 25th forward. Every day. This morning. This morning, talking to a wonderful man in Baltimore County who is the chief commissioner. Mike, last name I have I've forgotten already, and I shouldn't, but I, we, I called him Mike. Um, he is the he is, I guess, the administrative commissioner or the head commissioner for the Baltimore County District Court, and so he was with me this morning. I met him in the fall at the Towson Courthouse, and I'll see him shortly because he's going to take the time to come around and introduce me to his commissioners in Essex. And I begin, whenever I see the commissioners or the district court judges and other you know, circuit court judges, I begin by saying thank you so much for hanging in there. Um, the court issued an opinion that created a lot of um, interest, shall I say, uh, and certainly in the halls of the General Assembly, and certainly on the second floor of the State House, and certainly it became much of my life during the 90-day session. No matter, no matter the. The, I'm not complaining. It's the way it goes, right, Senator? It is the it is the process. But no matter what I was asking for on behalf of the judiciary, the questions inevitably turned to Richmond and to um, and to what it has uh, precipitated. I will say that when three days before Sine died. I received a call, uh, advised that uh, in the BRFA there was a provision. We had had our, our judiciary budget cut by $10 million, very short in the beginning of the session, very within days, mm, but I guess that I kind of expected that. Those $10 million were restored, not for why we had asked it to be restored, but to implement Richmond through the judiciary by making sure that we, the judiciary, um, placed attorneys at all these. <coughs> now my friends, I will have to say, I will say this to anyone, the judiciary, Chief Judge Morrissey, bless his heart, our new Chief Judge of the District Court, he hit the ground running, I handed him two projects, Richmond implementing the what, what we were directed to do, and I, if anybody doesn't believe, I mean, I believe in the law. I believe in what uh, case decisions. I believe in what the General Assembly directs me to do. I'll do it. I'll do it. So the judiciary, in addition to MDAC, which is huge, we now have Richmond. We were given $10 million to do it. We had to find the attorneys. Thank heavens for the attorneys. They're stepping up. I'm proud to say. But what I heard Chief Judge Morrissey say yesterday to a group of court administrators, clerks, and um, administrative clerks at the district court level. I now find myself, this is the chief, this Chief Judge Marcy, I find myself running the largest law firm in Maryland, 2,500 attorneys. But what's the problem with that? I'm a judge. I can't train them. I can't, dis to the extent, discipline. I can't help to get them to do the job better. I can't coerce them. I can't. I can't do any of it. The judiciary shouldn't be doing this, and that's what I'm going to try to make. Hope, well, fingers crossed. Hope to see if we can make um, some changes this this next session. But in the meanwhile, we're implementing it, and we're coming in under budget. Kudos on Judge Morrissey's appointment, by the way, from us of the district court. Great, thank you. Super. I, Just I, I, I super. Think, At every, think he's every level, from the clerks, the bailiffs, the judges, everybody says Judge Morrissey's the best. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Judge, for that. I'm, I'm so pleased that we have him on board. Uh, time for another question? 
I'll oh. make her late. Yes. Okay. Oh, no. I don't want to be late for court. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen.